Hello and welcome to the eighth in my series of presentations on the conflict between science and creationism. Today I'm going to be talking about the subject of transitional fossils, that is, fossils that link together two seemingly different groups of animals. As ever, I'm basing my talk today on the slide presentations of the infamous young earth creationist Kent Hovind. This means I'm going to respond to points raised in his slides, so I won't cover all of this topic by any means, just the bits that are relevant to creationist claims. Lots of these arguments are dealt with in the wonderful archive on talkorigins.org. Please search for their extremely detailed site and read their much more thorough rebuttals of these claims. You can find many of the arguments that I've used here on that site. However, I've added in a few extra bits to bring the coverage up to date. So let's get started. Often creationists claim that there are no transitional fossils for evolutionary sequences. But this is very rarely true, though the fossil record is, of course, highly incomplete. But of course we would expect that. For example, fossilization is extraordinarily rare. The only reason why we have so many examples is because we've searched for a very long time, and because there were millions of years with billions of individuals in which to obtain the favourable conditions required to fossilise the bones of dead animals. We shouldn't be surprised that this record is incomplete. Of course, the record itself is a work in progress. Huge fractions of the planet have never been adequately searched, and much has been destroyed by tectonic subduction. Certain species and types of species are obviously favourably preserved because of the environments in which they lived, which may have been more or less conducive to fossilisation. There's another very important point that is often made here too, regarding the possibility of satisfying the unreasonable demands that creationists make. Whenever we see two forms in the fossil record that are separated by a seemingly large chasm in geological time and physical morphology, Creationists often claim that the absence of a transitional fossil between the two, supposedly related forms, is a major failing of the evolutionary theory, citing gaps in the fossil record. Then, invariably, somebody somewhere discovers a fossil which beautifully fills the gap between these two original fossils, at which point the creationists claim, aha, now you have two gaps. Of course, their demands are ridiculous, but as we shall see, though there are a few gaps in the fossil record, most evolutionary sequences are breathtakingly detailed. The concept of punctuated equilibria was proposed in 1972 by Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould. This concept is the theory that the evolution of species does not necessarily proceed in a smooth, continuous manner, but that change happens rarely and rapidly, often after lengthy periods of neutral evolution where the dominant forms of each species don't change in any appreciable way. The theory is of course true in part. The speed of evolutionary change can be very variable. Certain creatures, such as the coelacanth, are still very much the same as they were tens of millions of years ago. In fact, the conventional view was that these fish, coelacanths, had died out with the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, until one was found alive and well. But in the same time that the coelacanth has barely changed, mammals the size of shrews had evolved into dogs, cats, horses, monkeys, and eventually human beings. However, the theory of punctuated equilibria is hardly universally accepted. In fact, it's universally rejected, at least in its most pure form. It is certain that evolution sometimes happens very rapidly, but it's also certain that it sometimes happens very slowly, over extremely long timescales. The debate today is about how the speed of evolution varies due to varying selection pressures. Furthermore, it's often difficult to resolve the true speed of evolutionary change. If you've ever used a microscope, you'll know that substances can often seem very different at varying levels of detail. Often the edge of a piece of material seems smooth to the naked eye, but when you zoom in, it's actually jagged. With the fossil record, it's like we have a fairly low magnification view of the entirety of evolutionary history. We simply don't have enough individual fossils to determine how rapid most changes were. Sure, most changes look pretty gradual in the timescales of tens of millions of years, but it's probably very difficult or impossible for us to tell whether or not, were we able to zoom in with greater resolution, the progress of evolution might actually appear smooth or jagged. Perhaps hundreds of thousands of years pass with very little change, followed by a very rapid transition over just a few dozen generations. Our dating methods just aren't that accurate with old samples, for a start. Any changes that occurred in a very rapid timescale will be highly unlikely to leave much in the way of fossil evidence for their speed of change. Lineages that creationists often bring up as suffering from gaps are those of the evolution of birds, horses and whales. I've included a fairly thorough, though obviously abridged, version of the evolutionary history of these groups of animals in the slides. The point to remember is that the sequence is in fact extremely complete for all three of these groups of animals, and in fact for pretty much any major modern animal group that you could name. So let's start with birds. 
Scientists now accept that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs beginning in the Jurassic period. This has been further strengthened in the last few decades with genetic evidence. When modern scientists build up an evolutionary tree showing which animals belong to the same biological groupings, birds are usually assigned to the order Theropoda, which is the same as Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptor from the Jurassic Park films. In fact, it's now believed that Velociraptors, the vicious predators of Michael Crichton's famous novel, were almost certainly feathered. Of all the theropod dinosaurs, birds are most closely related to Deinonychosauria, a clade or branch on the tree of life in the order of theropods, which was first classified in 1969. Based on a study by Zhang and collaborators in 2008, we can now with great confidence map out the evolutionary history of modern birds. I won't go into great detail here about the exact specimens, but suffice it to say that there are numerous species here which show a very clear evolutionary sequence from land-dwelling lizards through partially feathered proto-birds right through to the vast diversity of birds that we see today. The most famous proto-bird ever discovered was Archaeopteryx, a primitive bird that lived in the Jurassic period approximately 150.8 to 148.5 million years ago, and yes, we really do know it to that degree of accuracy. Archaeopteryx possesses a number of features that uniquely identify it as both a bird and a reptile. It clearly has feathers and wings, together with an avian toe and wishbone, but it also has features such as its pelvis, which more closely resemble the theropod dinosaurs that were already known. The exact precursor to Archaeopteryx is not yet known, and may never be found if it never lived in an environment where fossilisation was a likelihood. However, continuing work in western China and the Gobi Desert have provided a number of exciting finds in the last few years, so this debate may well be solved very soon. A huge number of proto-birds are known from the period beginning around 135 million years ago, primarily from finds in China, together with a few in Spain. This record has increased hugely in the last decade, mainly due to finds in Yixian and Jufutang formations in China. By the mid-Cretaceous, birds were very common, and are found in deposits around the world. Then by the late Cretaceous period, they were more or less indistinguishable from modern birds, at least to us non-paleontologists. Hovind is fond of quoting massively out-of-date sources, but sometimes he truly outdoes even his own shamefully dishonest standards. William Elgin Swinton was an English paleontologist and zoologist, born in 1900, who died in 1994. His textbook, The Dinosaurs, written in 1934, was a classic of its time. In another of his books, Biology and Comparative Anatomy of Birds, published in 1960, he said the following quote, The origin of birds is largely a matter of deduction. There is no fossil evidence on the stages through which this remarkable change from reptile to bird was achieved. Hovind thinks that this is a solid argument, but of course he doesn't mention one thing, that the quote is over 50 years old. Lots of things were not known in 1960 and are now very clear. proto for example, the controversial fossil linking bird and dinosaur lineages, was discovered in 1984. So yes, Swinton was approximately right when he wrote his book, but science has come on a long way since then. In fact, of the fossils on the previous slide, fewer than half were known in 1960. The evolution of the horse is another one that's often quoted by creationists as one of those animals that just sprung into being with a huge gap in the fossil record failing to explain its origins. As you can see from the size of the font I've had to use on this slide just to fit in the number of specimens we have, this is demonstrably false. Again, it's not worth going over every specimen in detail. As you can see, there are specimens from 64 million years ago right up to the present day, with only a couple of small gaps, and no doubt these will be filled soon. The most important specimen here is arguably Hyracotherium, or Aohippus, the so-called Dawn Horse, which was roughly the size of a common fox and which was first discovered in 1841. In the 50 million years since this animal lived, this early horse ancestor evolved through a number of increasingly large forms to the modern horses that have been in existence for around 2 million years. This is the last example I want to show in this presentation, just again to illustrate the dishonesty of the young earth creationist claims. Hovind is on record as saying of the theory that whales evolved in the last 60 million years from a land-dwelling ancestor, that is pure propaganda. There is not one shred of evidence for that. Well, let's have a look, shall we? Whale evolution is another fascinating story, with the earliest ancestors indeed living on land. Hapalodectes and Pachycetus were both small carnivorous mammals, primarily land-dwelling. Ambulocetus was the first creature that lived a semi-aquatic lifestyle. 
They had also wandered around on land rather like modern day crocodiles. However, by 47 million years ago, Rhodocetus was largely aquatic, and its descendants were increasingly so until you get to Dorodon, first seen 40 million years ago, which was entirely aquatic and was already beginning to take on significantly whale like qualities. Though at this time they still had sharp teeth and so were predators, rather than grazing krill feeders like today's whales. Basilosaurus was an 18 metre long aquatic carnivore, first appearing about 40 million years ago, only 10 million years after the first whale ancestor, Ambulocetus, took to the waters. Cetotherium, or whale-like beast, was first discovered in 1873 and is distinctly similar to modern day whales. It is the first of the filter feeding or baleen whales, like modern day whales, into which it later evolved. So that's about it for this presentation. To summarise, the fossil record is a major component of the evolutionary argument, but of course it is only a fragment. Remember that our genomes are, in a sense, another living fossil record, if that's not a contradiction in terms. See the presentation on genetics for coverage of this topic. The fossil record is a wonderful validation of evolution, but it is hardly the main component of the argument in the 21st century. The main arguments for evolution are logical ones. It is simply an unavoidable conclusion of the way in which life is set up that evolution must occur. In addition, modern genetics has shown us that what we had derived from the fossil record was very largely true. Of course, we've had to make a few changes, but we were very largely correct. In this way, evolutionary theory, together with paleontology, makes a large number of predictions that have been superbly vindicated. See also the previous presentation on fossils for more on this topic, where I went into a bit more detail about the process of fossilisation and some more general questions about the fossil record. Well, that's all for now. As ever, there's loads more information on my website at frame.net, where you can also find a transcript of this talk and all the following ones and all the previous ones, and you can keep up to date with my blog as well as learning about some of my other work. See you next time when I'll be talking about dinosaurs and man the rather juvenile claim that dinosaurs and human beings actually inhabited this Earth at the same time, not separated by 65 million years, as we now know to be the case. Thanks for listening.